for example, comparing um, a bicycle and pedestrian project to an EV charging project to a heavy duty diesel replacement project. And so it allows us to compare across several different project types and to, again, rank them based not just on total emission reductions, but the cost effectiveness of those emission reductions. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the collaboration with you and CARPO. So thank you. And then just um, a couple uh, extra questions for you. What, um, I understand that this is setting up some program revisions, but I just have some sort of fundamental questions about the program. If a road is in an ETJ of one of our counties, is it eligible for the discretionary, uh, for the fall call, the 62 million? Yes, if they're a member. If, if the jurisdiction is a member. So like Mecklenburg County ETJ roads would be yes. eligible? Yes. And who are, are, are all roads in an ETJ within the ETJ of a municipality or some like there are places that are not the city of Charlotte, but they're within city of Charlotte's ETJ. I'm trying to figure out who has the standing and responsibility to bring forward eligible projects for these roads in the ETJ. So I'm sort of looking at NCDOT. Sometimes NCDOT comes with the applications and they've worked with the jurisdiction or sometimes the jurisdiction does. So last year there was a Union County project, um, intersection improvement project, mainly for safety, which was awarded funds and it was in an unincorporated area, I believe. Okay, so um, if it is a orphan road, mm -hmm. is it eligible to apply for the $62 million? So it needs to be on the federal highway, the aid system um, or a state road um, yeah, so a local road would have challenges with this program. Is that a matter of state law or federal law? Um, that is, it's more federal law, right? Yeah. Okay. And do we typically use the full amount that's available? Because you were saying there's space, there's room. We didn't reach the $3 million threshold. Like, are we using the full amount that's out there normally? Or is some amount going unused? The, the fall called the 62 million, um, probably it will all be programmed. There are some MPOs that don't receive enough applications and they don't use it all. Um, I think that's probably few, but uh, that is not the case for CRTPO. <laughs> we'll you. receive more applications than we have funds for. All right, very good. Thank you, Jennifer. Any other, John? Uh, to kind of add on to what Mr. Rosenberg said, can we go back to the uh, inflationary data? Sure. I know you had a uh, footnote there of the source of this data. Yep. Um, these numbers are certainly different than other inflationary data charts that I've seen. So can you tell us anything about the origin of these numbers or what they include? Or Sure. And keep them, please keep in mind, this is for construction. So it would be different than like a consumer, you know, what you're buying groceries for. No, I understand. So sure. um, yes, this St. Louis Fed or number is commonly used with economists. Um, yep, I would probably keep using it. I mean, it's such a standard uh, place to get to get the number. But it is, I guess, obviously very specific for road construction. Is that this is this is um, this is inflation on construction in general. It's not it's not specific just to roadway. I, yeah, the reason I thought of this is we're building a, we're proposing to build a new fire station in Matthews, and we have construction inflationary costs that are much lower. They're not at, certainly not at 10% a year. So I was just curious. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Questions around the room? I'm not missing anybody. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate that. All right. We'll move down to uh, I-77 South Express Lanes update. So as we all know that uh, there was a request made to have a working group made up of NCDOT and CARPO staff and to look at two items in the request is review the unsolicited proposal and then conduct a comparative analysis. So these are two separate items. So during tonight's presentation uh, by DOT and, uh, and us in there, 
uh, we'll give an update on the unsolicited proposal review that we requested. And then we also have an update on the comparative analysis. So if you remember the history on this, then it goes way back. You know, we started this thing in 2007, uh, the express lanes history it had in 2010, uh, Mumpo adopted it. We get into 2014 and we talk about the 2040 MTP and the I-77 managed lanes. Then you get into uh, 2015 to have the feasibility study, 2016 that the uh, DOT ranks the project in P4. Then you get into 2018, you got CARPO, NCDOT and their ratings and uh, approvals. And then in, you have the planning and design studies done uh, for that. So in 2022, CARPO adopted the 2050 MTP, MTP and includes the project in that funded list. So, okay. So the FAST study, uh, FAST lane study had three phases. The first phase was an overall evaluation across the region. The second phase was a focus on the potential corridors and the projects I-77 South is one of them. Third phase was the efforts for I-77 North and the 45. As you may remember per state law, any uh, project that would be associated with some type of tolling in North Carolina must be approved by the local planning organization, which would be us. And so CARPO first submitted the I-77 express lanes south project during the P3 in 2014. So with that, I'm going to flip it over to Brett Knight with NCDOT D10. And we also have uh, David Roy here uh, to facilitate if necessary. But Brett, the floor is yours. OK, thanks, Ron. Um... Hello again, everyone again, uh, Brett Knipe and CTOT Division 10. Going to continue with our updates on the I-77 South um, efforts. And um, we'll cover a lot of information tonight, some of which you've heard before. Uh, some of this will be new. But um, again, we're, we're talking about uh, an unsolicited proposal that, that the department received from Centra to uh, proposing to widen I-77 South of Charlotte with um, express lanes through a P3 delivery, a public-private partnership. And we'll also talk about um, that uh, comparative analysis that Ron mentioned that you guys also asked us to perform in conjunction with that. So again, uh, February, 2022, that's when we received that unsolicited proposal. Um, I believe it was March the next month that we brought that to this board. Again, because as Ron mentioned, uh, we in North Carolina, we do, um, we're required by law to um, receive approval by the local planning organization, in this case, CRTPO, uh, to move forward in any direction with any um, toll-related project. So um, we talked about that for some time uh, up until February of uh, this year, where um, uh, this body approved NCDOT and requested NCDOT to uh, proceed with an evaluation of that proposal as well as um, to uh, conduct that um, comparative analysis. So uh, we, we formed a work group. Um, I'll cover the members of that group here, but it was made up of NCDOT and CRTPO staff, legal folks, financial folks uh, to review this document um, and then to eventually come back and report back to this group those findings, which is where we are now. Um, Neil, uh, again, y'all all know Neil very well. He was on the work group with me. Uh, Sean Epperson, our deputy division engineer who's in the room tonight. Uh, David Roy with NCTA, NCTA, chief financial officer, participated in that as well. He's also with us tonight. Um, and then we had other professionals with the department uh, that helped work through that process. And uh, we developed uh, an oversight team that uh, this work group would provide a recommendation to. And then that oversight team um, would ultimately um, make that final recommendation for NCDOT as to what to do with this, um, this document. And uh, Chairman Pappas assisted with, us, uh, assisted with that effort. Um, our chief engineer, uh, Chris Peoples, Western Deputy Chief Engineer, Mark Gibbs. Um, we had Carly Alexic, our um, Chief Communications Officer. Um, David, again, myself participated on that. Um, a lot of these folks um, you may have not met, but um, point being is that um, a lot of uh, folks that are involved in this business uh, that spend a lot of time thinking through this 
participated to help us draw these conclusions. And so um, we were able to form these groups and get started in earnest in May. Um, that was about the same time I think I came back for our last update. So we didn't have a lot uh, to cover at that time. But um, since that time, we've met, reviewed, um, and uh, found that uh, you know that proposal to widen I-77 South essentially was not materially different than what uh, we're already uh, looking at in our own STIP. And so I mentioned that to you guys before. There's been an ongoing effort to develop concepts um, to cost out to determine what would be best for I-77 south of the city, no matter what the delivery mechanism was. So we've been working on that the whole time. And, and this proposal essentially was um, proposing to, the, to accomplish the same thing. And so based on that, we've decided not to move forward. Um, the, the proposal itself, you know, it wasn't flawed necessarily, didn't have, um, it, it checked all the boxes, met, met all our minimum requirements. But um, again, that was that working group's recommendation. Uh, what's important to go ahead and note here is though, um, because we're um, not moving forward with this proposal, doesn't have any impact on what we're doing with the comparative analysis. It's not slowing down that process. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail later on the presentation, explain to you guys what we're gonna be doing there, but just wanted to point that out. So, um, you know, talking about the, the differences or maybe lack thereof between this unsolicited proposal and uh, what is in our existing STIP. Um, as Ron indicated, that, that, that project, I-77 South, um, I-5718 has been around for a number of years. Um, it was recommended by this group uh, to be included in the statewide transportation improvement plan. Um, we have been working on that project. It's been in development for a very long time. And the description there was to widen I-77 um, with express lanes from I-277 to the South Carolina state line. And the unsolicited proposal um, was in the same general proximity uh, to widen I-77 south uh, with two express lanes, a little bit shorter in length, um, not quite making it all the way down the South Carolina line, but proposing to terminate closer to the I-485 interchange. So essentially the same project. Um, and the, the bottom bullet there is pretty important too, because no matter what happened with this process, um, we were going to be required to um, conduct this value for money and comparative analysis um, due to the federal requirements. Um, anytime you're talking about a project of this size, um, with, with this uh, uh, scope and really cost, uh, we would have to accomplish this anyhow. So um, it's really um, no loss either way. And, and we're getting started with that work and we'll go into detail again further in the presentation. So <clears throat> the oversight team that um, I pointed out um, agreed with our recommendation from the working group um, to not move forward with the project again, because of its similarities with I-5718. Um, this really means uh, uh, nothing more than if we do move forward with a P3 procurement, eventually, if that's a decision you guys make, then, um, then that group that submitted the proposal, Centra, would not automatically be shortlisted um, for um, if, if they were to resubmit at that time. Because again, we would have to go through that process, competitively procure uh, the project. So moving on from the unsolicited proposal, um, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the comparative analysis um, and, and what that looks like in the timelines. So um, at the same time, when we were asked to uh, review the unsolicited proposal, we were, uh, we were asked to um, conduct this comparative analysis, okay, uh, by CRTPO. And, and all that really is, is it's a, it's a, it's a comparison um, of what would this P3 delivery look like versus a public delivery. Um, you know, there's a value for money uh, analysis that has to be conducted because obviously there's, um, uh, you guys have seen some of those cost estimates for the, the corridor, you know, that would be a very large sum of money to put up. It would be a very large sum of money for anyone to finance. And so in determining is, is it really worth um, the expenditure of funds no matter what uh, methods you might choose to move forward with. Um, the qualitative risk, 
Um, there's a lot of modeling that goes into this traffic and revenue forecasting, which is a very important component of determining um, the validity and uh, su potential success of any toll project. And then um, uh, construction cost updates, which uh, you guys saw in the previous presentation that um, we're all dealing with inflation. And so we've got to predict that and how that could impact any project as well. So um, the, this comparative analysis work, we expect it's going to continue on from now uh, on into next spring, um, hopefully around April in that time frame. Sometime thereafter, we could bring back information. Um, and we're going to be giving you guys updates in between now and then, but bring back maybe something with, uh, uh, you know, enough information where um, a decision could be made in one form or another. And there's a lot of details uh, that's, that are inside this work. Um, you guys can see them all out, uh, see them there on the screen. I won't read every single one of them, but again, it's, um, it's a collaborative effort, uh, quite a few consultants. Um, we're going to continue the working group to help review this. Uh, myself and Neil and others will stay engaged with the process. And even further down into um, some of those components, I mentioned traffic and revenue analysis. Um, subset of work that's going to occur under that um, line um, is, again, developing models, uh, determining the base case. Uh, that's part of what we're doing with the I-5718 project development. It's going to tell us what could this project look like, um, sort of at a, 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 a base scenario. And then the scenario and sensitivity development, where we might take a look at um, variations of, of alternatives deeper inside that project, what um, items might influence that project, such as cost increases that we just discussed. And, and the cost um, estimates themselves. Um, you know, we're hopeful that we're going to have more information, but I will tell you that it's, it's, it is becoming harder and harder to predict uh, construction costs. I don't think that's new information to this group. But um, so again, uh, we think we'll be near a conclusion on into next spring, or at least have information to draw a conclusion from. And so that's, um, that's the presentation. That's the update. I'll be glad to talk, take any questions. Um, and if others in the room, Okay, hey, questions to our proposal. Dennis. Yeah, thank you. Brett, you mentioned that the proposal from Sintra did not match the original specs of, of what you had in mind. Uh, did they, did Sintra have access to the specs and why would there be a difference? Did they leave something out that they had a reason for concern? Do you have any of that high level so, background? I think what I was trying to, to state was that um, it was very similar to the project that, that's already in the STIP. So um, as far as meeting specs or, you know, uh, there was nothing that would disqualify that proposal, if you will. Um, you know, it, it seemed to, uh, it seemed to, to represent a good product, but uh, again, it was just not materially different than what we already have in our, in our plan today. So to follow up, if, if they were, let's say, decide, <clears throat> excuse me, decide on a P3, if they were to come back and make a proposal, they would have to tweak what they submitted. It's not exactly what you were looking for. So if we're gonna move forward with a P3, we're gonna to have to uh, publicly advertise that. It's gonna to have to go out to competitive bid, um, if you will, at that time. And so anybody that's interested, that's qualified, could submit that proposal and be considered. Ed? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm trying to overlay what you just told us with conversations we've had before. So um, one thing that we were told by NCDOT previously was there was a very big difference in the timeline between the STIP process and the uh, unsolicited bid. So was that not a factor in the comparison that, that led you then to... So that comparative analysis um, will get into that. So, you know, we're going to have to uh, determine what funding would be needed when, if we were to, um, if we were to pursue the public or NCTA delivery option. And we'll, we'll have to use cost estimates and some of those constraints that we've covered in other meetings, uh, including our corridor caps. And um, then 
the details of the traffic and revenue work. Uh, it's going to we'll be able to apply that with more information to make a, a more informed decision. Right, but we did, uh, if you recall, we we, we saw a, quite a lot of detail on uh, timelines and things. And frankly, I thought that this body was comparing these two possibilities largely in the context of the time to delivery. That was the issue with the I-77 North. So uh, it's interesting. Uh, I, this is not unwelcome, by the way, but uh, it's interesting to me that no substantive difference was determined when the whole conversation here was about a possible seven to 12 year difference in the completion date. Yeah, so the scope of the project, maybe I should clear it up that way. We're talking about specifically the scope of the project wasn't materially different from what's in the plan. Um, the delivery method or where we're gonna get the money to build this really, um, you know, that's what was, you could say different about the unsolicited proposal, but um, the STIP doesn't tell us exactly necessarily where all of our funds are coming from because we do have alternatives, including a P3 to consider. Right. Um, the timeline really hasn't um, changed as far as when we might be able to put together a public option, but with this comparative analysis, we're gonna have more detailed information. And so we'll be able to move forward with more certainty. Um, if you remember, some of those timelines were very broad, right? There were ranges. We'd like to go and narrow that down some. So uh, is it also, is it news that now <clears throat> Sintra will not automatically proceed? Because again, I thought in earlier meetings of this group, we had considered the fact that Sintra might automatically proceed because of the unsolicited bid. But what you're telling us now is that no more work is being done to process the unsolicited bid and that Sintra, because of the finding that they were basically equivalent with the STIP, uh, <clears throat> so without prejudice, but nonetheless, there was no reason to kind of give them that automatic. Correct. And, and so quite honestly, given the sensitivity around Sintra, I think that's good news. Uh, I, I like the idea that they're going to be on a completely level playing field with uh, any other bidder and, and not sure. have a big advantage from having solicited, uh, submitted the bid. I guess the last thing was we did hear in the past a cost estimate of, I think, $2.1 billion. So uh, are you now expecting the number to be very different once this is done? So we're progressing the work on I-5718. And as we progress work, we're able to refine our estimates. Um, and given what we've seen, uh, the inflation numbers that were discussed here tonight, yeah, I would expect that that cost could continue to rise. Right. I, I think this whole discussion about cost escalation is kind of interesting because, uh, for one, nobody knows. OK, let's be honest. Uh, I do think that recent experience would indicate that 3 percent is too conservative, personal opinion. Um, last question, if I may, Mr. Chair. May. Uh, Based on the process you've described, you anticipate that a decision about the P3 would be made sometime in the spring next year, I guess, and that if this body decided to move ahead, at that time, you would issue the request for proposal and start the whole process of uh, engaging with potential contractors. So it's, it's the comparative analysis work that we hope to be complete with by the spring, and then after that, we'll be able to bring it back to CRTPO, um, and then it will be up to you guys to determine what the next steps are. That's right. Would, if, vote, it, if it right? looked favorable, <laughs> would we move forward with the P3? That's going to be up to CRTPO. And after that, if it's yes, then we could consider procuring or moving toward procurement at that time, advertising. Right, but you will have no further engagement with a potential contractor between now and then. Is that right? <laughs> well, so... Um, there will be some uh, soft market sounding activities that would occur as a part of the comparative analysis. So yes, we may speak with some folks in this industry. Um, that's part of that analysis, but nothing beyond that. But you would do that equally with Sintra and others. Absolutely. Wherever you, the expertise was, it Absolutely. would be useful. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. John. Thank you, Brett. Uh, help me 
understand the apparent contradiction, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but you said the working group and the oversight committee uh, decided not to move forward with the unsolicited proposal, but and yet you're doing a comparative analysis. What are you comparing? Are you comparing the Centra proposal that you, the working group and oversight committee said that you don't want to proceed with, or is no. it P3 in general? P3 a, in general. As an yeah. option. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's P3 in general. You know, it's a comparison of could this be a P3? Could this be a publicly funded NCTA delivered project? What would those two cases look like? But for now, there's no further dialogue with Centra? Yeah, the unsolicited proposal really doesn't change the outcome because after we were asked to conduct a comparative analysis, you know, that process moves on separately and independent of this unsolicited proposal. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Lee. Thank you. So had, just so I understand, had Centra offered a plan that was sort of substantively different, then this process would have continued. But because it was basically what you were already planning, it doesn't get to stand alone and continue in the process that it, I mean, is that is that first statement correct? Well, so... <laughs> The unsolicited proposal may or may not have moved forward, uh, regardless of what the content of it was, because the department reserves the right to uh, to reject any proposal for really any reason. So that outcome wasn't predetermined. Um, and if the proposal was different, um, that wouldn't have necessarily changed, but it could have. But um, that's a lot of what ifs. So. I think the important thing to realize is that uh, the unsolicited proposal itself um, was a separate item compared to the comparative analysis. And so we can move forward with that and get more information and then all have more um, more information to process and make better decisions with. But I just want to understand the reason why the unsolicited proposal, the process is ending, has been ended, mm -hmm. is because it was too similar to what was already in the STIP. That's is right. that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So then, um, so, all right. So Centra could be in the future, may not be in the future, but it'll be competing equally with anyone out there in the market. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Stephen. I just want to clarify something that uh, Councillor Driggs implied or said. Um, the Board of Transportation in no way would give Centra a card to go pass go. This was a long way before anything would be done. The other thing is that if the municipalities that are part of this organization believe strongly in this road getting built, which I do, I would suggest you start lobbying hard and soon because there's other sources of money. This is a lot of money. I think that they, there's many ways to do this, but we better figure it out. We better get it done soon. I'm astounded. I drive this road regularly. How it's congested, I don't care what time of the day. And we've got to find a solution. We need to look at interim solutions as well as what the final solution is. Oh, we're good. Good. Uh, I, I just want to understand what you're suggesting. Like, uh, I, I sense an urgency there, but what is it exactly you propose we do? What I've been suggesting at every meeting for the three years I've been here, spend more time with your legislative, um, I have to use the right word, those in charge of the legislature conveying what you want to see happen. This area gets a disproportionate on the negative side revenue for transportation. There's many reasons, but one is you don't speak up to the right people and therefore you don't get results. So uh, this body hasn't actually come together around a, an agenda to lobby the legislature. So uh, I was very careful what, what, to say municipalities, not the body. I said uh, the municipalities. Are you saying are the municipalities so that we should individually kind of just uh, step up? Absolutely. Uh, I, I just want to understand yeah. your recommendation. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. It's my personal opinion. That's okay. That you should it's good. It's step good up yeah. dramatically your engagement with the officials that run the House and the Senate. 
Yeah, I think you know I've been doing that uh, and on mobility uh, and on this. And you're right, they are really not paying much attention. So I think that's a very good device. Thank you. Oh, very good. Anybody else, any comments, thoughts on the room? So it sounds like uh, this one is informational for us. So I don't think there's any requirement for any vote. Thank you, Brett, appreciate the effort. I wanna say it was a good collaborative and very eye-opening effort to be able to sit and watch that movement. And we wanted to make sure that we basically opened up every box on the topic to make sure we weren't missing anything that could be to our advantage, but it doesn't seem like even from the timeline that there's enough of a advantage that by their criteria, that would be able to move that project forward with an unsolicited proposal. So again, to be clear, the project is still moving down its originally intended course. And to Stephen's uh, comment is, you know, it may move faster if we have more influence uh, at the legislative body level in Raleigh. So uh, I will strongly recommend that we all do that individually. And if we decide to do it collectively, I guess that's another discussion someday but uh, maybe that could happen. I've got a question. You have a question, okay, go. Just to be, be totally transparent and clear, um, say it was Centra or any other P, P3 uh, that we tried, tried to go along with, does this body right here, CARTPO, have to vote on that for it to go forward? Or can that be done independently by DOT? We, we vote. Yeah, we, we vote on that. Yeah. Because uh, I believe it was uh, Mayor Edward said that when the um, northern portion was built, that the contract came in signed, um, the deal was already done before this board ever even voted on it. I went on the board then, so I don't know, but that's what I've been told. Well, certainly, hopefully we're better <laughs> advised, more experienced, different board, different time. So hopefully let's play with that and not to dwell on the past because I know it's it's really a sensitive topic for everybody. And, and, and Mr. Chair, the, the yes, NCDOT has repeatedly told us that they will not proceed uh, other than uh, with the support of this group. So I think we can be confident based on what they've said in the past that they won't do anything that we don't know about. And I'm sure we're all gonna keep them on their toes. Yeah, one, one other quick comment. I'm a member of the Metro Mayors, and I can assure you that the Metro Mayors group lobbies for <laughs> transportation dollars every time we go to Raleigh to meet with Phil Berger and, and the, everyone there and governor and everyone. So we've been trying, um, kind of falling on deaf ears, unfortunately. Yes, Lee. Mayor Higdon, I'm really glad you asked that because I recently got an email where it was asserted to me that CARPO plays no role in project finance. So I, to your point, I want to be really clear, like this person was, I think, telling me, you know, you can, you can vote upon whether or not you want to have managed lanes or not, or, but you can't decide how it will be financed. And that was the ex for, you know exactly what was just recently said to me. So again, isn't that the thrust of your question, Mr. Higdon? Yes. Okay. And the, some... and the answer, who's answering the question, and what is the answer? Who answers? Who's answering the question? Who can authoritatively answer that question? Stephen, I don't know if I'm authoritatively <laughs> capable of answering it, but I'll answer it to the best of my ability. And a lot is in the actual wording. Does this body decide on how the funding will take place? No. Does this body make recommendation to the board on what structure should be used? Absolutely. Would the board do something that this body didn't want done? In my opinion, no. But if you get into the nuances of how it will be funded, that'll be a DOT decision. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Thoughts and comments around the room anymore? All right, we'll move on then. Upcoming agenda items. Mr. Burke, you're up. September 20th, CRTPO board agenda is anticipated to include the following items. Uh, we have two action items that we're um, anticipating. Uh, approval on the CRTPO discretionary program policy revisions, which you heard an information report about tonight, uh, as well as uh, approval of the uh, CRTPO planning area boundary uh, as an outcome from the 2020 census. Uh, and then we have uh, four information items. We have uh, 
Federal Transit Administration 5307 Transit Agency Annual Reports from our four transit providers within our planning area, an update on the Connect Beyond uh, initiative, um, CRTPO public involvement update, and a CRTPO strategic plan update. And I just, I have a um, two other quick announcements. Uh, this one is about um, an upcoming Metrolina household travel survey. Um, so NCDOT and SCDOT along with uh, local partners will be launching this travel survey. Um, these are conducted uh, approximately every 10 years. The results of the survey are the major input into the regional travel demand model, which um, we use heavily in the development of our metropolitan transportation plan, as well as our tip development process. Um, this is the most critical tool for understanding how people travel in the region. The survey will begin on September 15th, um, and it will go through November 2023. Um, NCDOT and SCDOT will issue a media release before the survey opens in September, um, and this would affect uh, all of your member jurisdictions. Approximately 5,000 surveys will be collected randomly from selected residents in the 12-county Metrolina region. Study participants will receive a gift card for their time. All survey results are confidential, and information collected is not shared to external parties. And then I just have one last announcement. This is about the Federal Highway Administration Certification Review Report, FHWA provided the final report summarizing CRTPO's quadrennial census on July 31st. Um, uh, we are pleased to report that the review resulted in no corrective actions and only three minor recommendations, which we plan on addressing the development of the 2055 Metropolitan Transportation Plan later on this year and, and into next year. Um, this positive outcome is, is a result of strong and supportive leadership at the CRTPO board, the technical coordinating committee, um, and uh, lead planning agencies, as well as a high-performing staff. Federal Highway Administration staff has offered to conduct a presentation on the outcome and the recommendations within the certification review report. Um, please let the CRTPO board leadership or staff know if you'd like this item uh, placed on an upcoming agenda. That's all I have. All right, thank you. That's a good positive note. And we have Loretta over here smiling all the way down. So thanks for the help with that, going through that whole process. Appreciate you being here. Uh, we'll move over to a couple of cleanup items. Uh, we're, we're talking about the MOU and the legal counsel, the RFP for that. So just a small update on that. So that is, uh, that was the RFP was issued in uh, July 19th, closed on August 11th. One proposal was received and uh, staff is reviewing that proposal and re will report back to us after that review. We certainly hope it will be uh, at or before the next meeting so we can have it on that agenda. So uh, right now um, it's at that stage. I see you have a question. Speaking for John. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, John, you weren't gonna let that happen, were you? So, all right. And then and the next one is, is talking about the, uh, the managed lanes questions. Uh, a lot of us uh, had questions. I think there were 50 questions uh, that we wanted submitted to mobility partners. Uh, that has happened, submitted to them. Uh, and it's on the existing I-77 uh, lanes between Mooresville and Uptown Charlotte uh, from seven of the board members. So I think the seven know who they are already. We're gonna give you that consolidated list uh, almost immediately after by tomorrow, probably morning, you'll all have those for your review. We've, uh, again, they've been provided to the I-77 mobility partners and DOT, because again, we look at the protection of the uh, the relationship. Um, we can ask them that, but the relationship is between DOT and uh, mobility partners. Uh, and given that the questions seem to have a very, very wide range of complex issues, it may take both parties, NCDOT and I-77, a little bit of time to respond. So we're, we're going to await that response. So we should have that back shortly, uh, shortly certainly being before the next meeting. And some of them, again, are complex. Some may be answered in a day or two. Some may take a little bit more time to answer those. So we want to await their response to us on the 50 questions. They may categorize some of them and say, I can answer one, seven, and five this way, and I can get that to you by Monday. I can answer other ones at certain time levels, but we're going to let them respond back to us. So again, a co complete copy of the questions that were submitted will be distributed to this board uh, later this week, probably tomorrow. And so and Neil has that one. Yep, and, and I have just one more announcement. I, I forgot about this one, and I apologize. Jarrell has an announcement on the transit providers work group. 
Good evening, everyone. I'm Jarrell Leonard with CRTPO. So the status of the trainership providers work group is we're in the process of not only getting it ready to kick off in September, but we're also conducting interviews with the transit providers within the CRTPO planning area. We're working with Central Line and Regional Council as the primary body to be the facilitators. We are also going to have next month, as was previously mentioned, the 5307 annual report from all of the providers that's going to come before your board. That is one of the initial things that's going to be embraced and brought into the transit provider work group. So just be on the lookout next month. And also the interviews will be conducted starting next week with all the providers, including CATS, all the way down to Union and Iredale County Transportation. And great. Thank you, Jarrell. Appreciate that. All right. So we're down near the end of our meeting here. Any other comments, thoughts, uh, sharing for the good of the group all the way around? Stephen. Uh, Mr. Chair, I want to inform the board that tonight the state legislature voted SB 512. You may remember as it relates to transportation, that moves the divisional appointments to the legislature and it moves the at-large appointments to the governor. Thank you. And you say voted, we didn't, we don't have the results of that or we do? They voted in the affirmative for the bill. Okay. All right, thank you for that clarification. All right, uh, seeing no other hands go up, everybody wants to go home. So I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second, all the way around, aye. Yes. Yeah. Of course. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Got a couple of uh, resolutions. Okay.